Episode 8 picks up the next morning, and Uncle George is taking some of the liquid from those vials and just writing symbols on the walls. He then heads into the bathroom in Leanne's room and starts sharpening up that dagger while bawling his eyes out. Now, downstairs, the Turners are preparing breakfast for Uncle George because Dorothy is thrilled about the note that she found. Sean warns her, are you sure this is what it means? And she says, yeah, what else could it mean? So Uncle George's crying fit is only interrupted when Dorothy brings him breakfast, and he walks out of the bathroom acting like he was fine. She lets him know that they ordered a Betamax player for him, but it might not arrive in time because they're supposed to get about 15 inches of snow. She tells him, I want to help however I can because we made a deal. And that's when she hands him the note, saying, this came with your box, it must have fallen out of it. George reads the note, looks at Dorothy and says, then you know, it is time. He then asks to use Sean's grill that's outside, which is kind of bizarre because it's snowing out in late December. And Dorothy has no idea why he wants to use the grill, but she allows him to. And when Sean sees it, he's a little perturbed. He kind of gives Dorothy a look and she says, don't give me that look. I've got everything under control. Now, the Turners do not know where Julian is. They figure that he slipped out early in the morning because their house is so big, but actually Julian didn't. He woke up and hopped online to research the fire that took out Leanne's entire family. He prints out some of the pictures and the articles from the internet, goes over to the attic door and knocks on it, but Leanne doesn't come down. He tells her, I was at your childhood home. I saw what happened to it. If you ever want to talk to somebody, you know you can talk to me. But Leanne still doesn't answer, so Julian goes snooping in her old bedroom where George is staying, and he finds the box. And after examining it, he finds the items in the box, everything except the dagger because George hid that. He finds the vials, starts sniffing them, but he can't figure out what they are. And he also finds a lighter, which he keeps. He then hears music, though, coming from the upstairs attic, and when he passes by the door, he notices the door has been unlocked and left open. So he heads upstairs. When Julian goes upstairs, she's playing a bunch of old records, and she's kneeling down in front of that mannequin in the green dress. She looks at Julian and says, what do you want? And he says, well, I know I'm only here because you want me to be here. You obviously want to talk, so shoot. And Leanne says, I don't even know where to start. Julian points to the mannequin and says, well, why don't we start there, because that's a little odd. And she tells Julian that the mannequin reminds her of her mother. She shows him the news footage of the first day she met Dorothy at the beauty pageant. And all the way in the background, you can see the way that Leanne's mom is treating her, and it's not great. Julian asks, well, how close are your aunt and uncle to your mom? And she tells Julian that George and May are her, quote, chosen family. They're not even related. They told Leanne that God sent them down the road where God had buried her in ash, and that God had given her a second chance. She then puts on another record that she found, telling Julian that they're not supposed to listen to music because it's a dark temptation, and that's something that she doesn't understand. Julian then pulls out the articles that he printed out, showing them to Leanne, but Leanne's big takeaway is, look how my mom is holding me, so if she wants to drop me. Dorothy would never hold Jericho like that. And Julian asks, what does Dorothy have to do with this? And she tells Julian that she used to think Dorothy was the best mom, but she was wrong. And Julian thinks that's really unfair, because what happened to Dorothy was an accident. It wasn't her fault. And Leanne snaps back, then whose fault is it? And then Julian, pulling out that lighter that he stole from the box, lights himself a cigarette and says, for the time being, it's mine. He then plays a voicemail from Dorothy a couple of days before Jericho died. Dorothy is begging Julian to come over because she is overwhelmed without Sean around. The baby won't stop crying, and she asked Julian for two to three hours, but Julian never showed up because his dealer had gotten some really good drugs and that was something that he couldn't pass up. And he's lived with this guilt. What would have happened if I just showed up that day? And the whole point of this story isn't to have Leanne feel bad for Dorothy. It's the fact that sometimes bad things happen. And you act like they didn't, but that eats away at you. Leanne then reveals to Julian how the house fire started in Wisconsin. It started because of her mom's green dress that she loved. Leanne decided to destroy it, thinking that maybe if she destroyed the dress, her mom would replace the dress with her. So she threw it on the burner, not realizing how fast a fire could start. But she wasn't even scared as the fire blazed. And her aunt and uncle told her that it must have been God working through her, because terrible things happen for a reason. But she looks up at Julian and says, If that's God, I don't want anything to do with him. Now, all the while this conversation's going on, the Turners had an unexpected guest. There was a knock at the door, and it was Roscoe. And Dorothy had never met Roscoe before, so she's a little surprised when he showed up at the door. But Sean reassures her, yeah, no, I do know him. And Roscoe says, hey, let's go outside and talk, which is odd because, once again, it's snowing in late December. And Sean fills Dorothy in that Roscoe was the private investigator that he and Julian had hired to look into Leanne. And that really annoys Dorothy. She can't believe that her nanny was under investigation and that information wasn't shared with her. He tells her, though, I didn't want to involve you. She then turns to Roscoe and says, well, what did you find? Anything that can help us get Jericho back? But he says, not really. I found an old burned down house. That's about it. 
She tells both of them, every detail we can learn about these people is important, no matter how significant it may seem. But the more that Dorothy talks, the more she's getting stressed out, and Sean can realize it, and Roscoe offers to go inside and get her a glass of water. And as he's doing so, he hears the basement door close behind him. And that's because Uncle George had gone throughout the house collecting a bunch of pieces of wood. And he went downstairs and put all the wood in a pile like a teepee in the hole that Leanne was buried in. And then he started speaking in tongues while slapping a Bible. So when Roscoe hears the door close, it really piques his interest. And it takes him a little bit of time to get a simple glass of water. He used the excuse that he had to go to the bathroom. At this point, though, the Turners have been sitting outside for a while, so they want to go back in. And Roscoe tries to convince them to stay outside, but they say, no, we're cold. We're going to head back in. And that's when Roscoe says, I'm sorry, I can't let you. He told me to keep you guys out here until sunset, no matter what. And Dorothy gets really pissed off and says, who? But then she realizes it must be George. So she barges her way in the house and finds George walking downstairs and yells at him. What, you just thought you were going to walk out of this house without living up to your end of the bargain? And he kind of looks at her dumbfounded and tells her, I needed time to prepare. We need to do these things alone. The reunion will happen when the clock turns. And that answer is sufficient enough for Dorothy. Sean, meanwhile, was kicking Roscoe out of their house. But before Roscoe leaves, he turns to Sean and says, Sean, just to let you know, something's happened to me. Things are changing and for the better. And it all started after I met him. I can't really explain it. But when he asked me for a simple task, I knew I had to say yes. What I'm trying to say is, you can trust them. They're not like us. They're special. And then Roscoe takes off. Now, back with Uncle George, he continued to go through the process to get ready to, quote, reunite them. Going into Leanne's room, blasting the B-52s while smashing his head against a wall, which probably led to a concussion, but he's bleeding pretty profusely from the forehead. He then heads outside to the grill that he lit, where he pulls out a poker, heading back inside and grabbing a piece of meat from the fridge and just throwing it in the sink. Now, the Turners have no idea what George is doing, and Leanne and Julian have no idea what George is doing, or the Turners for that matter, because they're still upstairs bonding. They end up kissing, a kiss leads to sex, and Julian gives her the ultimate compliment, bawling his eyes out because that ass is heavenly. But they end up falling asleep together, and Leanne is awoken when, shortly after midnight, Uncle George comes up holding that dagger, and Leanne asks him, are you planning on hurting me? You told me you loved me. And when she sits up, she knocks over a candle that starts a fire, and that really freaks out George. He falls back, but Leanne acts like she doesn't even know what's going on. She just tells George, everybody lies to me, and George is terrified and tells Leanne, she's going to come for you. And Leanne says, then let her. I can handle May. But he says, no, not May. And then he flees the house, backing up into the street all the while not taking his eyes off of the attic window, which Leanne is at. And Leanne watches her uncle get hit by a car. She also, by the way, did put out the fire, kind of. And this is all going on while the Turners are sleeping. But right before they went to bed, Sean did check his hand, and his hand is pretty much cured after using that ointment that George had made for him. Thanks for checking this recap out. Consider subscribing to the channel and liking the video if you liked it. Hit thumbs down if you didn't. If you don't see the next episode in one of the end screens, not to worry. It'll be up shortly. Be nice in the comments section. If you heard a mistake, hey, mistakes happen. You don't have to point it out. You can just keep it moving. And check out my guys over at Scene Invaders. They're reacting live to each episode of Servant. It's not a recap. It's just their reaction to the episode. It's really good stuff. Check them out as well.